for such an important, existentially relevant scientific enterprise, we were unable to solicit funding from capital for the very reason that you mentioned, that they want ownership and they want financial incentives. I think, and we think, that there's a world where you can do both in an ethical way. You can make money and you can also do these things, but the entire economics world system has to change. I will have to say that too. Um, the country system as it stands today, this idea of centralized governance, centralized institutions, is not sustainable. Um, I think it's brought us into a deep, deep mess. We are experiencing hyperinflation globally all around the world. Every country is having their dollar devalued. Uh, we are barreling towards World War III and geopolitical disasters. American lives will be lost. That's no joke, right? It's going to be serious. Um, and so this country system, this idea of separating humans has only, I think, it served its purpose. <laughs> We've discovered artificial intelligence, quantum computing, reusable rockets. We're good. Like, I think we can unify now. <laughs> um, so thank you so much again for your thoughts, Sam. Oh, yeah, please. In addition to the issue of having to come to grips with this economic model, by means of which we can figure out how to motivate people to, to fairly and equitably develop the natural resources on the planet, et cetera, uh, that, that's one thing. The other thing is this nationalism thing. The nation-state system that was created by the royal families in Europe, you know, in 1625 to kind of divide up the world, is another. And it, it raises its head consistently as quote national security. Okay, they always say, "Oh, well, you got to be worried about national security." Like, what if the Russians get it or the Chinese get it or something? You know, like as if there are some kind of foreign species uh, of some sort. You know, uh, it, this we've got to come to grips with that. That whole structure has to be revisited as well as the economic structure. We have to start perceiving of ourselves as a planetary culture uh, and, a, and a human species because the time has arrived where we're going to have to come to a sense of ourselves as a species vis-a-vis -vis other species, actually. You know, they're sentient, intelligent, and highly technologically developed. So this whole, whenever they keep raising these two problems of, you know, uh, you know, well, we did the State of the World Forum at the end of the Cold War. We brought it all together and brought, you know, former presidents, vice presidents, secretaries of state, all together to try to figure out how we can can have a, a new worldview at the end of the Cold War that is mutually advantageous for everybody on the planet. Uh, and the problem was is that we were relying upon contributions from major corporations to be able to fund it. Uh, and so that, that I was in charge of a thing called the Strategic Initiative to identify the new paradigm, the new post-Cold War paradigm at that conference. You know, and, uh, and I had the uh, Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, one of the, the major public relations firm in the whole world, came to us and was offering to say, look, we'll, whatever the new paradigm is, we'll advertise it for you. You know, we'll market it, we'll, we'll make t-shirts for it, you know, we'll sell product. He said, but you have to keep in mind that the, you have to, whatever the new paradigm is, it has to have transnational corporate capitalism as the sole mechanism for economic development. Uh, I had to say no. That we can't we can't agree to that <laughs> in the same way you can't sell your soul, you know, to Microsoft or to anybody. And, and so the, the same thing is true of the nation state. So the the second issue that we're going to have to come to grips with, which is very controversial, is the second elephant in the living room, and that is this whole thing of nationalism uh, in national security. And I'll say one thing: this so you have to say at least something controversial, which I haven't really said yet. You know, the, it, 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 well, no, that, no, that one is that isn't be, that's, 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 that's beyond controversy. You know, this this one this one is is that the, the the reality is is that we need to come to grips with the fact that our country, the United States of America, since 1945, has been a major aggressor in the world. Uh, it is attempting to establish full military dominance over the planet. And it's doing so, and, and they say so, if you want to get the technical uh, the proof of this, look to the, the, the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance document that was issued immediately after Gorbachev dissolved the Soviet Union. And it said right in that document that, that we had to devote ourselves to trying to establish full military dominance over the planet. And the purpose of it was, was to secure and maintain 
our continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials needed by our major corporations. Okay? Uh, and, and they say it just like that. Uh, and so that we have to come to grips with the fact that you're going to keep running into, oh, you got to be careful here. you got to maintain our national security. And then you say, what does that mean? What, you know, how secure are we by having a massive thermonuclear war looming over us every, every generation? You know, we've got to overcome this. So both capitalism and the structure of the corporations and the issue of national security and national dominance over the planet to maintain our privileged access to the strategic raw materials. This is something that we're going to have to come to grips with. These are issues that we're going to have to deal with once we come to acknowledge that this UFO thing is real. Okay? This, I'm just trying to get us to the other side of the line. What do we do in response to this? Because we don't want to look stupid to the other people in the extraterrestrial civilization to keep ourselves attached to these primitive, totally self-destructive structures. You know, we have to organize new structures and come to grips with this to merit our citizenship in this galactic civilization. Okay, just so you don't get out of here without having some kind of person. So I realized I'm on one of those stages where you don't want to be someone like me where you, you wait your turn. So I realized I should just jump in and I'm, I'm sorry, Marilyn, we haven't gotten to, although I asked Marilyn if it would be okay if I, I jumped in. I want to give both a controversial and imaginary perspective as we've heard here, but I also want to get us a bit grounded and that's often my uh, function uh, in these conversations. It's, sometimes it's unfortunate to me because usually in my academic career I was creating controversy and, and at the line, but I often feel with UAP we have to we have to come back down to the ground because this is an inherently ungrounded subject and you know I want to I want to offer a sober word about this is remember that you know most of um, most institutions in the United States and especially the rest of the world, and remember the U.S. is at the vanguard of the UAP conversation, most institutions are not run on the premise that UAP are real. So we have a vast amount of work to do still to reach public consensus about that. So note that I gave us optimism at the beginning of, of this panel, but I'm also going to give you some pessimism about that. Um, you know, we're still far from that. Uh, as Danny mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, despite years of work now in Congress on this, that's very incipient work. So here's what I'm going to say that's controversial. We don't want to front load the conversation with too much idealism of different kinds. That's what I would advocate for, whether it's, it's in, and of course, I'm very close in many respects to Danny politically, but more pragmatic, whether it's socialist idealism, whether it's Silicon Valley idealism, whether it's technocratic idealism, um, which I think you enunciated that position. Um, I would say we want to approach this in a very, very pragmatic spirit where we're remembering that even as we get closer to public consensus, people don't get that this is an important issue, okay? They, they still see it as a curiosity or they react with a kind of, I think it's a healthy human narcissism where they get hit with the idea that it's real and that as you've noticed, they can kind of forget about it. And that's very strange. That's probably, that's probably because we're, we, there's something we resist about the reality of this, whether that's out of anxiety or, or dread or um, uh, you know, some kind of deeper fear. Um, anthropocentrism, but regardless, there's still a resistance to it being like palpably real. And so we have a lot of work to do to push people to getting that it's real. And while that happens, every other problem in the world goes on, okay? And a lot of the things Danny's calling for, or Deep's calling for, or Jesse's calling for, or that I would call for, or Marilyn's calling for, you would want to do these things anyway, even if UAP and NHI didn't exist, okay? And we've ignored, I mean, you know, we, we are catching up with AI as a global problem that needs global governance and probably civil society governance. Uh, we have ignored climate change. Uh, we've forgotten that thermonuclear war remains a possibility. And I would add also, and this is a thing that's become very important to me as I've worked on UAP, that we've forgotten that 
we really don't function well as a species, okay? I mean, we, we tolerate um, uh, poverty, we tolerate disease, we tolerate a lack of education in, uh, you know, masses of our fellow human beings. And, you know, one thing I would like to see from the UAP and NHI conversation is that we start to think about what we hold in common, essentially, despite our diversity, as a species, and begin to embrace the idea that we should try to achieve species cohesion, regardless of whether there, there's any kind of big reveal from the UAP themselves. I mean, keep in mind that they have spent the last 80 years being very oblique in their interactions and their communications with us. We have... We, there's nothing to tell us that that's going to change in the next 10, 20, 30 years. 50 years from now, they could still be kind of showing themselves a little bit and departing, um, waiting for us to reach something like cohesion at a political level so we could actually interact with them. So, so you know, keep in mind your, your problems aren't going to go away uh, the, the day we have public consensus or presidential revelation about um, and I say all that because I think to kind of move the conversation forward on this, let's remember a lot of these things are good in and of themselves. And how can we articulate them to or join them to uh, the UAP conversation? We know a lot of there, there will be a way, given that there is extremely advanced technology and science possibly at stake in this, uh, if, we, if we have the right uh, advances in that, that area. Um, there will be geopolitical issues that arise that have to do with this, and there will be a conversation about what humankind is that comes from this. So all that is there, but you know, I would just say this is an inherently ungrounded subject, so what you want to do is really keep your feet on the ground, because the flight of imagination and idealism with this can be very, very extreme, and most people end up kind of uh, ungrounded. So that, that's my contribution to kind of getting us, uh, you know, and, and I, want to, I want to comment on the eminent domain question again. Um, you know, the UAP Disclosure Act, uh, which is the legislation that's being uh, alluded to here, probably will be reintroduced in the Senate by Michael Rounds this year. And a lot of us feel that, uh, you know, we should all lend our support to the passage of that legislation. The, the important thing about that is that we know something like, uh, uh, you know, a controlled, gradualist government disclosure of what information they do have and what they would feel comfortable being released uh, isn't going to happen, as it never happened in any previous presidential administration, if you, if you don't have a dedicated group of people whose job it is. You can't take a Secretary of State or a National Security Advisor and one day say to them, uh, go do this and take care of this in your spare time. So, you know, Carl Nell, uh, you know, who all of us work with in different capacities, uh, uh, former uh, Army Colonel and, uh, interestingly, aerospace executive, um, is one of the hidden authors of that legislation. And he's really emphasized that's why you need it passed, is you need something dedicated in an administration, I would say a responsible administration, um, let's hope we have one, um, that could you know, rationally and systematically try to tackle this. Um, the reason you may want the eminent domain provision, despite the controversy around it, is in Carl's mind that's designed to kind of call back all the technology so that the U.S. government knows what it has. It's, uh, you want to be able to uh, uh, do an accounting of what's there, um, uh, make sure that it's all uh, under control of the U.S. government so that, um, in fact, you don't have private corporations and entities that are holding on to it um, to initially the detriment of, of uh, uh, the U.S. government. But, of course, what we want ultimately from that, of course, is something that benefits humanity. Um, but I put that on the table for your consideration because I think that's going to become controversial again and we're going to have to have a conversation about uh, the merits of it. Awesome, guys. So um, I think uh, we should also start winding down for presentations uh, soon. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess uh, I think uh, what I'll do is just summarize what we talked about and we'll start getting to presentations. Um, and then... I think everybody on this panel is going to be flooded after, <laughs> so uh, we'll save some of the answering cognition for that. Um, 
Yeah, so we've covered a lot of ground. We have covered um, all the way from anthropological discussions about UAPs to historical perspectives uh, to political and regulatory perspectives. Um, I think we're starting to, the consensus amongst us, at least here, is that we all seem to agree that something needs to change. Now, what that change is, how do we actually execute this properly? How do we actually democratize an open source anti-gravity research, for example, that can, for example, be weaponized, right? That's, that's how the government gets you. <laughs> because if you can't answer that question, how are you going to stop us from being weaponized against Americans? Good luck. <laughs> so, and so um, yeah, so that's what we're going to be answering uh, or hoping to answer both through Open NHI and uh, through other perspectives. Um, and so with that, uh, gentlemen and lady, <laughs> thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, I love you. So, okay, I, I just want to give presentations, but then, uh, but if you guys are fine, like if you're, okay, yeah? Sick. Then let's go for another 30 minutes because I don't want Marilyn to just answer and then nothing. Like we should have good conversations. Awesome. So then, Marilyn, I'm going to ask you a hard one that you're not prepared for. <laughs> awesome. Um, I guess, uh, so, the question then is, what are your thoughts on how do we peacefully um, broker diplomacy and bring about these really potentially highly powerful and weaponizable technologies to the public and bring it to the world uh, in a sort of safe manner? I think part of that is an anthropological question as well. but. Right now, though, in terms of protocols, data, and research, um, yeah, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts? As I'm sitting up here on the panel, I realize that open source is kind of a techie spiritual exercise. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's part of the answer, right? Um, yeah, my background is I'm a tech entrepreneur, and I'm fairly new to the UAP space, and uh, I think maybe I represent, maybe some of you can empathize with me kind of being in this like, yeah, new wave of curiosity, but then also turning that into action. And I think this hackathon and what the amazing five teams are about to present is valid proof of that. So um, yeah, when I kind of came into this space, I was kind of looking for the data. So my, my lens is through, um, in my previous companies, whether in robotics or beauty tech, I built hardware um, systems that then digitized data that was otherwise offline and then using that and building an AI data layer on top to then um, help yeah, make processes and systems more efficient and things like that. So kind of taking that lens and that playbook to the UAP space and I was, yeah, curious. I guess I came across all of this through, um, yeah, some videos of like uh, Chris Bledsoe who was able to kind of repeatedly capture these orbs and post them on a daily basis and I was just curious like how what are these things I've never seen them before so um, so yeah I kind of just went hopped on a flight went to a conference and asked for hey where's the database like where can I look into more of this and there isn't really one there's a lot of more like archaic fragmented systems out there or closed systems um, so so yeah so I was just kind of doing more digging and then uh, I met deep and then uh, at the Seoul Foundation Conference was where I saw my first UAP. 